and we've got to this mosaic and it marks the start of the Pembrokeshire coastal path. The altitude we've just found out is the same as climbing Everest. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. We are Filkins Drift, a folk duo from Cardiff and Gloucestershire. And we've decided to make our next tour more sustainable. So we're walking all 870 miles of the Wales coast path. We're playing over 45 concerts and we'll be meeting some inspiring artists and community leaders along the way. And this week we've walked 104 miles from Aberystwyth to Trevene. Well, so the story of Cantagwaelod, the sunken kingdom out there. Um, yes, I mean, we know that there's a river valley running out across there. We've, we've surveyed it, actually. Earlier this year, I had a, a boat come down from Scotland and they were mapping the, the seabed and underneath the seabed. And so we've yeah. got the Ustwith and the Aran are flowing about two kilometres offshore. Down there, they didn't go straight out to see at Aberystwyth. They swung south. You followed their path this morning as you walked the cliffs. It's on your right, two kilometres offshore. This um, river valley comes down all the way to almost to Newquay before it swings off offshore. Um, and we know <coughs> that um, in this valley there's peat because it was they did a borehole in the 1960s out there and recovered peat. It dates the peat is dated to about 10,000 years ago. Peat doesn't form in seawater only forms in fresh water. So we know that uh, 10,000 years ago it's dry out there. Our research suggests that the modern coastline was largely where it is by round about just after 10,000 years ago. So the sea's right. coming in. So any stories about land out there are older than 10,000 years old if we take the story at face value. Yes. And um, only Last night I got an email from uh, somebody I know up there saying they've just found a, a bone yesterday in, in, in deposits up at Dunnes So I'm hoping to go up there tomorrow and, and recover it. Oh, wow. Um, probably it's Iron Age and date. I know where they, where they found it and we've recovered other bones from that area earlier um, in the year and back in the year, the great year of 2020 when nobody was supposed to be out. Um, we did quite, quite, I did quite a bit of work Relative walking time. up and down. Uh, on my times out from, uh, from the house, we'd go up and, <laughs> and see what was there. Ah, oh, we've just had a very interesting afternoon with uh, an archaeologist who lives locally called Martin. He was talking about this valley, the, the river Ustwith, which is what Abur Ustwith is named after, and another river I forgot the name of. They've got a valley that comes all the way down here. And he was saying that now what the, the mammoths and the reindeer and the, and the horses used to use and graze in, that channel is now used by dolphins um, who use it to sort of, you know, get up and down as some calm water. Which is amazing, isn't it? Just to think how how much the world changes. Yeah. You know, rel I mean, he was talking about huge timescales, wasn't he? Geological timescales, but you know, relatively speaking, like a blip. And a, yeah. Like, impossible to imagine, really, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a little child. And the kind of things that they're doing now, quite expensive toys and stuff like that. Yeah. And here's the granny. There's, you know, very simple, you know, homemade go-karts and conkers. You know, oh, yeah. very simple little things. Skipping, you know, dressing up but with your mum's clothes, you know what I mean, rather than um, having, uh, having, like they have over there, sort of Batman suits that you yeah, buy. Yeah, I know, the you know, fancy you know. costumes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and well. we, made, we made this in in the uh, in the pandemic as well. So uh, we we oh, sent, really? yeah, I did all the drawing. Well, we had a big meeting when everybody talked about with with the um, dementia group what they did when they were young, 
my made great big list and, and they sent out lots of um, messages to people in Labrera and they sent hundreds of things back and lots of children what they do um, and then with all the background obviously I wanted to be playful so um, made it colourful and everything and there's colours lots, are amazing and lots of lots of toys if you look I know thing. I keep spotting at first yeah. you just think it's all colour and then you start to spot all the little things coming out I know so so the lovely thing about mosaics is that um, you can all sit around a table and they're not hard to make. I mean, they need me to sort of tell them what to do, sort of thing. But you can sit around and say it's very sort of um, very community good. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. Somebody might just put half a dozen in. Somebody might do loads. But um, you know, you can see it happening and growing. And then it's up on the wall, and they're proud. And there's a sort of a, an event when we put them up, and the mayor comes along, and everybody has a cup of tea and things like that. Yeah, uh, a ceremony to exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so it's it's. There's, there's lots of aspects that make it really, really um, meaningful for people. So that's the kind of thing that I do, and there's, I've done oh, maybe you. 50 like that around, wow. around Wales, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for showing us. Oh, well, yeah. it's nice too. I've been, I really enjoyed last night, and my family did too, and it was really nice, yeah. Oh, it's a good yeah. fun. Yeah, we really, last night was lovely. So we're here in Avararon with the lovely Will Crawford from yeah. Quiet Notes. How are you doing, Will? Yes, very well. It's great to join you guys. Yeah, it's been lovely doing some walking with you today and, and yesterday and as yesterday. well. Yeah, no, I've had, a, I've had a full two days with you guys. So can you just tell us a little bit about what you do at Quiet Note? Yeah, absolutely. So I started Quiet Note in the final year of my degree at the Birmingham Conservatoire because of lockdown. Um, when I noticed a lot of people were struggling with their mental health and well-being, and something which had always really helped me had been a personal mindfulness practice and being locked down and having no work as a musician, I thought, well, is there a way to explore the relationship of music and mindfulness together? You know, a lot of people really struggle to get into mindfulness, get into meditation. However, when you start talking to them about music, they've got that relationship. So actually, can we use music to almost bridge the gap between the two? And so that's what we do at QuietNet. We lead workshops, classes, experiences, helping people to understand their well-being, mental health through mindfulness, but using music as the sort of main teaching method. Well, can you tell us a tiny bit about your journey into mindfulness, how you sort of came to be a mindful practitioner and a mindful sort of person? Yeah, I guess it was when I was just finishing school, so what, 18 years old, um, I had a sort of decision to either go down a bit of a well, either go down a science medical route or go and study guitar. And I really decided, you know, it sounds a bit cheesy, but it was a bit of an epiphany and I realized I actually wanted to go and study guitar at a conservatoire. And so I took a year out of school to practice guitar, dedicate myself to that lifestyle. And during that time, I had a crazy great uncle who lived up in North Yorkshire who gave me a book on Taoism called The Tao of Winnie the Pooh. And it completely changed my perspective on everything. Um, changed my perspective on music, on life, and at the end of the book I was like, I need to actually, instead of just reading about meditation, I need to practice it. And so I did, I, it was just a personal practice and it saw me all the way through conservatoire, and as I was just saying, in my final year I got trained up as a mindfulness practitioner to go from just having it as a personal practice to it being part of my career. With the rambling edge. Had a lovely night in the Pentry Arms. Chris is gearing up his leg warmers for the day. Got a bit of guitar worry though. You can't see it, but it's kind of a bit warped on the back. And the varnish is starting to come off, and a little bit on the bottom as well, which is concerning. Mm. On the case. 
It's the tiniest bit damp down here. I've just taken these off and I'm going to blow dry them with the, uh, <laughs> the hair dryer that's in here. And I miss them more than ever words could say If I could just taste all of her others now If I could hold her in my arms today Then I wouldn't want her any other Today's been a bit of a, it's been actually one of my favourite days of walking, although I say that about quite a lot of them. It's been lovely. Lots of up and down on this Ceridigian. Ceridigian? Ceridigian coast path. Lots of this. People keep warning us of Pembrokeshire and how hilly it's going to be, but actually we met a lady last night, no, this morning, who said she's done, she did um, Ceridigian and Pembrokeshire. And actually, Ceridigian is way more work. And it does feel like that. It's been a lot of up and down. And we're pushing through the last six miles of today because we're playing at six o'clock and we've got to do a sound check beforehand, a nice little PA gig. But we may end up getting there at 10 to 6. <laughs> and all we can do is keep plodding on and uh, see what lays ahead. I've just been on the phone to the luthier who made this guitar and he said it's almost definitely a mixture of the humidity but also these waist straps that are like really pulling the guitar into my back pretty much to the limit of what a high-end guitar can take and uh, so I've tried going the whole of today we've done about 15 miles and we've got about three to go without waist strap and the shoulders aren't feeling great. <laughs> so it's yeah, definitely... Some big rubbing action. Majorly rubbing. I've been trying just to walk with like a flat back like this. Just, <laughs> just to take the weight off. Which is not really sustainable. So... Let's go back to like our eight, eight brutes. Go back to, oh, our eight brutes. Yeah. That kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, regretting that already. Oh. Yeah, so we're gonna have to think about this because I can't, as much as I'd love it, I can't really afford to destroy this lovely guitar. But equally, we've got quite a lot of gigs to do and a lot of walking to do. <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> Sun has just come out on a Tuesday morning. Absolutely glorious. And we've got to this mosaic, which is made by our friend Pod, who we met in Aberath. And it marks the start of the Pembrokeshire coast, coastal path, which we'll be doing for the next two weeks. It's very long and wiggly. Yeah, it's 300 kilometers by the looks of it. 300K. And 
the altitude we've just found out is the same as climbing Everest. Yeah, <laughs> that's a bit of a thing, isn't it? Crazy, crazy elevation gain. <laughs> so we're climbing Everest over the next two weeks, in effect. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Look how stunning this mosaic is there as well. And all these places we can see that we're going to be. And come from. Yeah. So we're in St Dog Miles right now. We're playing in Newport this evening and then Fishguard tomorrow. On to St David's. Round, wiggle wiggle to Milford Haven. Across the bridge, luckily we don't have to go all the way up this estuary. <laughs> yeah. Across the bridge to Pembroke. Tenby, Amroth and beyond. Two weeks. Now this is another one of these lime kilns. We've seen, we, when we were with Martin, the archeologist, we saw at least 20 of these, but they seem to be everywhere in this stretch of the, the Caradigian Pembrokeshire Pass. Maybe that was what, we were looking at a seal and then there was a little hole. Maybe that was all, another kiln in that little bay. Oh, Freddy's getting right in the kiln. Right up the chimney. Whoa. There. In the kiln. So the viewers will be able to tell us what to film was the in there. So I think they would have brought the limestone in, in from this port and then smelted or processed it or whatever. Whatever you do. Whatever one does. Whatever, whatever one does. Lime. When you have lime and a kiln. If you know, let us know in the comments. You know what this is? What is it? It's Phil Kiln's drift. Hey! <laughs> Quite an iconic moment now. We are about to leave Cardigan Bay, which we've been, we've been swooping down here for days. We joined it, it starts at Bardsey Island. And Bardsey Island itself was quite an iconic point for ages. We could see it for a really long time, but I've got no idea when we were there and how long this has taken. And this, this is now the pinnacle point we leave at Stumblehead Lighthouse is where the, the Cardigan Bay path ends. And here it is. And there it is. <laughs> and the lighthouse is actually on and spinning and shining. Which is yeah. Cool to see. On spinning and shining. We've not really had many actual like lighthouses that we've been able to see functioning. Yeah. But Cardigan Bay has been, it's been an amazing journey because, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
We've just been flying down it because there's so little wiggling around. We're now in, essentially in South Wales, Southwest Wales, in, I don't know, 10 days, two weeks? I really have no idea how long it's taken. Five days? Five... I don't know. <laughs> at the end of week five, week amazingly. Week five? Which seems mad, doesn't it? Week five sounds like... That's five's a big number. <laughs> five is a big number. <laughs> yeah, because it still feels like we're just halfway, but actually we're a lot more than halfway at this point. And it does feel like week five, like every day is quite hard work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like physically, and just doing so much. Yeah, it feels like about two weeks ago, everything felt quite easy. We had like yeah. a really nice, we were in the rhythm of it, and it was still quite fresh. But now it feels like the work has picked up again. It does, yeah, the <laughs> admin has somehow picked up. It has, and the physical work, like Pembrokeshire is hard going, to be fair, because it's very up and down. Yeah, yeah, and that's it's the very thing. Very wiggly. We're we're day four of Pembrokeshire, and it's already very wiggly <laughs> and up and down. It's wiggly in in both axes, isn't it? Like <laughs> it's w wiggly vertically <laughs> and horizontally. <laughs> yeah, we are climbing Everest after all. Yeah, after we metaphorically. Are. We are, but it's been a good first four days of Pembrokeshire. It's been. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> Stop pointing the camera at me, it's really weird. <laughs> I learned to, what I learned today is to forage pennywort. I think that's what it's called. So we won't go hungry again. We won't. We won't. <laughs> Chris will point out all the leaves and shoots and roots that we can eat. And, oh no, I forgot the name of it, but it apparently tastes a bit like apple peel, the other thing that I can forage. My favourite snack. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll never have to buy bag lettuce again. Good. We're saved. <laughs> but if you wanted, this is actually, this used to be a school. We're in a hostel, which used to be a school. And then after it was a school, it was a very bad hostel. And now it's a very nice hostel. <laughs> it's sort of a medium hostel. <laughs> medium hostel. Didn't you say it was... Uh, voted in Germany or something it was voted the worst hostel in Europe yes its previous iteration was yeah in its previous management in the previous world it was the worst hostel in Europe <laughs> but now there's no way it's the worst hostel in Europe it's one of the best hostels I've been in today wow <laughs> <laughs> well do <laughs> yeah that was suitably insane <laughs> <laughs> 